Okay, th uh, th thanks, Stephen. I'd like to thank Stephen Barry for allowing me to talk to you today. And I'm just going to share my screen today and hope you can all you can all see this. Can you, can you see that, Steve? Yes, indeed. I should add, people, that uh, we are recording this session. Right. Thank you, Mike. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about this Victorian detective story involving Dr. John Snow in Victorian London and the hunt for the source of cholera. And I'm talking to you from Thanet, which is in East Kent, which today is gloriously sunny, for, amazingly. And East Kent is basically 20 miles east of Canterbury, and I live in a town called Broadstairs. So off we go then. So I'm going to divide the talk into three bits. First of all, I'm going to talk about what life was like in Victorian London. Then I'll talk about Dr. John Snow and what he did to find the source of cholera. And then I'll go on to talk about post Dr. John Snow, his leg legacy and what it led to. So this slide is the summary of life in Victorian England. As you can probably appreciate, it wasn't very good. Life expectancy was very low for males and females. Child mortality was about one in five. And be before the advent of um, vaccines and um, antibiotics and stuff, infectious diseases were the main cause of, of killing people. Plagues, cholera, which we're gonna talk about today. Treatment was very poor, as you might expect. Leeches were still there, although leeches just are coming back today as well. And a variety of things like arsenic and mercury, which I think might poison you as well, but good things like laxatives and bleeding. But housing was a big thing. It was poor, overcrowded, often no running water, often no sewage. They dumped sewage in the streets, they dumped sewage in the rivers. And as they were taking their water from the river, disease, and also there was excrement anywhere from horses in the streets. And they used to employ young boys to get rid of it. Health care only if you can afford to pay. So not very nice. And here's a quote from Jane Austen in a book, Emma, saying, my dear, my dear child, truth is that in London, it is always a sickly season. Nobody's healthy in London, nobody can be. So get, get your picture there of unsanitary conditions leading to widespread diseases when they turn up. And here's an, a, an idea of what it was like, where people are a cartoon from the time, showing the living conditions of, of people. You can see it's dense, it's overcrowded, uh, often back to back, often no running water, it's used by a pump outside, Often sewage was dumped into the river, or sometimes just dumped outside. And here's a woman looking for something. So not, not very good, not very well dressed, i.e. a great way for disease to spread. And of course, if you did have a privy or a loo, what you call today, this is a shack outside, and therefore they would dump all, all their excrement into the river. And this is Jacob's Islands in Bermondsley. And of course, people will uh, take their water from this river and hence they might get disease. So very, very unsanitary conditions in Victorian London and elsewhere. But there was a national survey done in the 1800s looking at life expectancy in various locations, big cities like Manchester and London, and also more rural like Rotland. And you can see here is the average life expectancy for professional people Rotten's quite high. Then as you go to tradesmen and labourers in Manchester, it, it drops off considerably. And in London, it drops off considerably. If you're a labourer in Manchester and London, crikey, you didn't live very long at all. In Rotland, the professional people, as, as in London and Manchester, lived the longest. But the tradesmen and also labourers also lived a fair, fair life as well, quite different to Manchester and London. And this led to one of the reports by Edwin Chadwick in about the 1840s, reported on the sanitary conditions of the labouring population. And he made a clear link, as we do today, between disease and the living conditions. And he said, we need to do something urgently about this. 
but he believed in the miasma theory of the disease, which we'll talk about a bit later. And this really means that diseases were caused by the smells emanating and wafting through the, the air, which you breathed in and caused your diseases. And that's the way you thought the disease would spread. So he saw eliminate the foul air and the disease would go away. He did support a rapid removal of human waste through improvements to the sewage system and drainage system. Although this took an awful long time to come through as we'll see towards the end. So not very nice. And here's my asthma theory. This is a color lithograph from the artist John Seymour depicting cholera. This is cholera as a skeletal structure robed and this black vapor is the miasma or the vapor spreading cholera throughout the population. So they believe that diseases were spread by these emanations, these smells or vapors or miasma. They didn't know about bacteria or viruses in those days. And the word miasma comes from the Greek meaning pollution. And it gave rise to the, to the name of malaria through medieval Latin, literally meaning bad air. So they believe disease is spread through vapors uh, going through the atmosphere. There were lots of cartoons about it. This depicts the, uh, the River Thames in London, heavily polluted with junk, feces, excrement. And here you've got the diseases emanating up, the miasma emanating up for leprosy, smallpox and malaria on the polluted river. But here they are looking now, what's, what, what's the cause of cholera? And here we are, the London Board of Health trying to find the cause of cholera because they didn't know. And I like this one at the top, it says, positively, we must find something. And then it says, it won't do to lose our 20 guineas a day. Crikey, that's quite a whack to get in that time for searching for the cause of cholera, almost an incentive not to find it. Now looking to, on the right hand side, if I can only just find a smell, and they're looking everywhere to find a cause of cholera, but right at the bottom it says, looseness of the bowels is the beginning of cholera. Because cholera is a, is a disease of the small intestine, and the, what we do know is a bacteria now lodged in the small intestine causing massive fluid loss, dehydration, and almost death. How do you treat it? No one knows. It's, given, it's some from St. James in Westminster giving notice to the poor about cholera with all these uh, physicians you can go to, to if you've got it. And there are suggestions here what to do. You can't really read that, but it's said you should take meals which consist of wholesome foods with moderate use of beer. You should abstain from spirituous liquors. You should wear warm clothing and be clean. And you should stop getting cold and wet and don't wear damp clothes. And you should get a good sleep and don't share your room and open the window to let, let things come in. Well, if you're living in an unsanitary condition in, in London, as we show from those previous uh, pictures, that's impossible for most people to do that. Hence, cholera spread. And here's a cartoon from the time saying, how you treat it? Here's a board of health, got no idea. Could starve people, give a blue pill, emetic to make people sick, or just FIFO from who knows? So the no cholera is a bad disease. They've got no idea where it comes from. And they've got no idea how you treat it. So enter our hero, John Snow. He specifically uh, investigates a London cholera outbreak, as we will see. He was born in York, and he moved to London in 1836 to start his formal medical training, which he finished in 1844. At the time, it was assumed that cholera was airborne, vapors emanating through the environment, i.e. the miasma theory. Now, John Snow didn't believe in the miasma theory he, because he argued the fact that it must enter the body through the mouth. And his rationale was, if cholera spread through the, the air in vapor and you breathed in the vapor, cholera surely should affect your lungs, not your intestines. And he argued that you must be taking something into the mouth 
rather than breathing in a vapor like miasma. And in 1849, he published his ideas on the mode of communication of cholera. And his thing on the, on, on the, on the left with Dr. John Snow, now as an MD, he argued that cholera was caused by exposure to contaminated water. And his time living up north before he moved to London, he looked at the correlation between transmission of cholera and polluted waters in a whole host of northern cities, but even some southern cities like Bath, and suggested that cholera was caused by people drinking polluted waters, i.e. not breathing in miasma vapours. And here's a report from the London Medical Gazette in 1849, very dismissive of his idea. It says, notwithstanding our opinion that Dr. Snow has failed in proving that cholera is communicated in the mode in which he's supposed to be, i.e. Dr. John Snow says, you're gonna get cholera by drinking polluted water. They think he's wrong, but obviously he deserves thanks of the profession for endeavoring to solve the mystery. And then it says quite cheekily, it's only by close analysis of facts and the publication of new, new views that we can hope to arrive at the truth. Well, I would argue that he was telling the truth and the truth was inconvenient at, at the time for these uh, learners. So that was his first foray, which was, which was rejected. Then what he's most famous for and talks a lot about in books on the internet was the cholera outbreak in 1854 in Broad Street, London, in which over 600 people died. So it's the most terrible outbreak in Broad Street, Golden Square, and the Giant Streaks. There were upwards of 500 cholera attacks in 10 days. This is a report from one of the papers at the time, saying the mortality of this cholera outbreak probably equals any that was ever caused in this country, even the plague, and it's much more sudden. The cholera does come on very suddenly. The mortality though, in these areas, might have been greater had it not been for the people in the area just left. And in about six days, most of the inhabitants where the cholera outbreak had took place basically left because they were scared of getting cholera. And in those days, they would probably die. So armed on that, what does he do? He, he goes off to this area and he decides to talk to people, asking them what they're doing. And this is a report that he gave in 1854, it says, on proceeding to the spot, I found that nearly all deaths had taken place within a short distance of what we now call broad, the Broad Street Pump. Then it says, there were only 10 deaths in houses situated near to another pump. Okay, but in five of these cases, the families informed me that they always went to the Broad Street Pump as they preferred the taste of that water. Crikey, it must have tasted really good then. And in three other cases, the deceased children went to school near the pump in Broad Street. So what he's saying is, and then he says, but although people were drinking from other pumps, or were near other pumps, they were taking their water from the Broad Street pump and dying. And after deaths in the locality, there were 61 instances in which he was informed that the deceased people you to drink the pump water from the pump in Broad Street, either constantly or occasionally. So this is good scientific. He went along and asked people what they were doing rather than assume what they were doing. This is what he found, that people who drank from the Broad Street pump, a lot of them got cholera and a lot of them died. Then he said, result of my inquiry is, there's been no particular outbreak or prevalence of cholera in this part of London, except among persons who were in habit of drinking water of the aforementioned pump well. So what he's saying, cholera is only occurring in those people drinking water from the Broad Street pump. Then he had a chat with the Board of Guardians of St. James's Parish, where his pump is, told them what the circumstances was, in the consequence of what he told them, the handle of the pump was removed the following day. This is what John Snow is famous for, removing the, um, the pump handle from Broad Street 
so people can no, no longer get the water and cholera disperses. And that's what people believe. And there's his cartoon. Where here's, here's the people taking the pump off. Here's John Snow looking at the water to see if he can see something in it. And it stopped almost immediately. And little by little, the people who left their homes came back to their houses. So far, so good. And, but the officials refused to do anything though, to clean up all the cesspools and sewers, all the sewers in the streets. But importantly, once the cholera outbreak had disappeared, they put the handle straight back on. They just humoured him, didn't quite believe him, just humoured him. So, so far so good. But here's the data. Did removing the pump actually work? Here's the cholera deaths per day and this cholera outbreak in the Broad Street pump. You can see by the time the handle was removed from the Broad Street pump, cholera cases were declining anyway. So you've got to ask a question, how much difference did that make? And it was even something that John Snow himself actually recognised because he said, there is no doubt that the mortality from cholera was much diminished by the flight of the population because lots of them just left the area, which commenced soon after the outbreak. But the attacks had so far diminished before the use of water was stopped. So he recognises that. So it's impossible to decide whether the well still contained cholera, poison in an active state, or whether from some cause the water had become free of it. So he still believes it's the water outbreak, although you could argue from that evidence, it's inconclusive. And he couldn't find the source of the cholera. As I said before, this examination of the well, looking at the water, failed to show any problems. It looked okay, was, there was no great, there was no excrement in it. It looked all right, really. And the pump was reopened and no more cholera appeared. So again, what's going on? We couldn't find the source. And a few months later, they did. An associate of Snow, looking at the death records, found a report of an infant who had died of diarrhea, i.e. one of the first signs of cholera, at the, at the beginning of the outbreak. And the timing of this infant's death suggested that she could be the point source of the cholera case. And then the investigator talked to the mother of this child, and the mother said she'd emptied a pail of the infant's diarrhea into a cesspool in front of their house, immediately adjacent to the water pump in Broad Street. And then they excavated the cesspool and the pump, revealing that the cesspool was in a few feet of the, of the well, was leaking, and the wall of the well was decaying, so therefore, the uh, feces and the cholera could go from the cesspool into the water supply. And if people drank that water supply, they would, they would get cholera. But as the infant died, it, and as the cholera went away, it probably means this was the only cause in that area. So once the child died, there was no further contamination of the world, and the epidemic ended. So there's only one cause, each child who died, such so that when they put the pump handle back on and people started to drink water, cholera didn't appear. But he persisted and he started to delve more into the data he had and started to introduce the effect that less guys, it is the source of water that is causing cholera. And he produced, which is now the, 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 his famous map, and here it is. This is a map of the pump in Broad Street, and these lines are cases of cholera. The bigger the, 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 bigger the line, the more people who are uh, getting cholera and dying. And here's a more um, up-to-date version of his map showing where the public pumps are in that part of London. And in here now, the red cases of where cholera is. So you can see primarily, well, all the cases of cholera in red here, 
are clustering around the Broad Street pump and not really around any other pumps around, suggesting to someone that the source of cholera is drinking water and not uh, vapours emanating in the atmosphere. And then he did something else. He went along and looked at different parts of the population and found this. There's the Broad Street pump and there's a workhouse. Very few of those workers got cholera and that's because they had their own source of water and didn't take water from the Broad Street pump. Even closer to the Broad Street pump was the brewery and the brewing process uses very hot water uh, when, you, when, you, when you do your hops and things like that, therefore the cholera is destroyed. So he had good reasons to see it is the water, they didn't drink it in the workhouse, in the brewery, they, they killed whatever was causing cholera because the water was very hot. I.e. trying to say the association is drinking contaminated water which is causing cholera. And then he did something which was quite smart. He did what's called a natural experiment. He looked at houses and where they got their water supply one. The big two water companies in London at the time were South Water and Lambeth. He looked at a number of houses they had, the number of cholera deaths, and commuted the death rate per 10,000 houses. So you can see that people who got their water from Southwark and Vauxhall uh, were almost 10 times more likely to catch cholera and die than people who were getting their water supply from Lambeth. Why was this? Well, this was because this is the River Thames where Lambeth and Southwark were getting their water supply from. And here's the flow of the River Thames, an effluent was being discharged into the River Thames here at this point. Southwark and Vauxhall were getting their water downstream of this effluent, i.e. contaminated water. Whereas the Lambeth uh, Water Company were taking their water upstream of effluent discharge and therefore it was far less contaminated. So again, proving the link, it's water supply, contamination. So he wrote another report, he updated it. In 1855, he published a much expanded second edition on the mode of communication of cholera. And this included the map we talked about, this famous map, and all the natural experiments he'd done on the water companies to, to support, as far as he was concerned, that it was drinking contaminated water, which was a source of cholera. But he was ignored. Although by then people were coming to the idea that polluted water may play some part, was gaining ground. And he died three years later in 1858 from a stroke and he was 45. He's buried in Brompton. So he died not knowing whether, whether any of his um, thoughts and observations and scientific rigor had made any difference. And of course at the time it didn't make any difference at all. People still weren't slow in saying it's contaminated water. They still believed in miasma, that it was the vapors emanating from them. So, is it gonna get any support? Well, just not long after he published his book in 1855, yes, there was someone who supported him, and this is the Reverend Henry Whitehead. He didn't believe John Snow. He read his book, remained unconvinced, simply because the um, um, cholera cases were going down before he moved the pump head. When he put the pump back on, cholera didn't reoccur. As so, things like that says, I'm not sure you're right. And so he do, he do his own inquiry of the Broad Street pump, from his point of view, bleeding in miasma, not polluted water, that he would falsify Snow's hypothesis. He cut out inquiry himself, very much like John Snow had done. He went and asked people about who got cholera, where they got their drinking water from, and so forth. And he wrote his report in 1855. Slowly, and I imagine reluctantly, the conclusion was reached that the use of water from the Broad Street pump 
was connected with the continuation of the outburst. So although he was a skeptic, he did his own research, just like John Snow had done, and come to the conclusion now, yes, it was the water supply from the Broad Street pump, which is causing cholera. But not everyone's, not everyone's buying into this. And here's William Farr, one of the first, I guess, medical stat statisticians at the time. And he also conducted a scientific investigation of the Broad Street outbreak, which he published a year later. Now, William Farr was a person who believed in this. Four years before his report came out, he was convinced that elevation was relinked to dying from cholera. And he produced all these charts saying, the higher, the, the higher ground you are, the less chance you've got of getting cholera. The lower the ground you are, the more chance you've got of getting cholera. And he suggested that deaths were greatest where the smell from the sewage polluted Thames was worse, i.e. at almost sea level, and that death diminished with the altitude while you're farther away. But if you look at the diagrams he put out, it's a concentration of deaths at the relatively high level of the Broad Street pump. So the Broad Street pump isn't at sea level, it's fairly high. Therefore, that will go against his series that the higher you are, the less cholera. And the way he argued around that was, in the vicinity of this pump, cholera may have arisen, not in the water containing cholerary excrements, but simply in the fact of its impure waters having participated in the atmospheric infection of the district, i.e. it's the vapors, the miasma theory. So although his data um, disproved this elevation theory, he still came back on, he's still miasma though. So he didn't support it. But then there was one massive outbreak 10 years later, long time there for John Snow had died in 1866, which killed 5,000 people in Whitechapel. Same guy, this time he did conclude that had been caused by polluted water drawn from the River Lee by the East Water Company. The evidence, he, but the evidence he, he got was exactly like John Snow got in his Broad Street pump, clustered around people who were getting their water supply from a particular area. And therefore, he now suggested that the population in London probably inhaled a few cholera corpuscles floating in the open air, but the quantities taken would be insignificant in its effects compared to the quantities imbibed through drinking water of the rivers or of ponds in which cholera dejections, great word, had found their way and been mingled with the sewage by the churning tides. So basically what he's saying he is now is, is that they got their cholera by drinking polluted water because sewage was being dumped into rivers and ponds and the River Thames. So he actually changed his mind, and this might now be the beginning of the end for the miasma theory, possibly. But what happened? John Snow's dead. Did it do the thing? Three years after John Snow died, Parliament actually did something about it. And this is called the Great Stink. And this is because, because of the Thames are so polluted, and the smells were so offensive that Parliament had to stop its work and go somewhere else. And so they decided, well, enough's enough. It's, it's, it's affecting us now, so we better do something about it. And that ended up commissioning uh, Bajeljet to do an efficient sewage system from London. And here's Bajeljet, Bajeljet and his pipes uh, getting rid of the sewage. 82 miles of underground brick, dealing with 420 million gallons of water and waste. But what, what he did, though, was, was collect the sewage and dump it untreated further down the Thames to be carried away at high tide. So it's removing the source of infection, sewage, from people who say working in Broad Street, but he's dumping it 
further down the stems. They haven't got rid of the problem, they've just given it somewhere else. And there's a classic sinking a few years later of the Princess Alice boat, which sank in the River Thames, and loads of people died. And they died because the death would have been smaller if it, if it had sunk elsewhere, because it went down close to one of the main sewage outfalls. And it was from this that the, that the, the powers that be decided, A, we've got to start treating the um, sewage, and that also, especially in London, they started to dump their sewage out at sea. And ultimately, that's not a great thing to do. Ultimately, that led to the eventual development of sewage treatment plants. A few years later, comes the germ theory of disease sponsored by Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch. And Robert Koch did identify the bacteria which caused cholera. So therefore now the miasma theory is well and truly gone. Now people are starting to believe that 1890s, 1900s is caused through germs, not vapors emanating around the environment. Here's what we know today. Here's the bacteria causing cholera. It's got its little thing, it's called a flagella. It goes through your stomach, latches onto your small intestine, and make sure small intestine secrete water so you get lots of watery diarrhea and you get dehydration and you can die. So it spreads in contaminated water, feces are basically the main cause, and it goes to the small intestine where they multiply. You're basically releasing lots of fluid, not absorbing stuff. You're going to become very dehydrated and you, you'll die if you don't get treated properly. But the treatment is basically drink more intravenous salt solutions and some antibiotics. And in some communities, the death rate can be 50% of people, even today. So it's still a very nasty disease in other parts of the world. But what was his legacy then? John Snow. And he targeted it in that 1850, he published those two books on what he thought was the cause of cholera and basically was largely ignored. He was not considered an innovator or even an important figure. In fact, he was more widely known for his work on anesthesia and the use of chloroform in surgery. And here's the obituary from The Lancet about Dr. John Snow, well-known physician, died on the 16th at his house in Sackville Street from attack of apoplexy, which he would now call a stroke. His researches on chloroform and other anesthetics were appreciated by the profession. No mention of cholera, no mention that it's drinking contaminated water and therefore suggesting the miasma theory is wrong. Quite some time later, the first UK medical officer of health, John Simon, wrote that he thought John Snow's hypothesis was the most important truth yet acquired for the prevention of epidemic disease. And by that time, basil jets pumping the sewage out into the sea and the cholera will go down in those areas because now their water supply is like cleaner. So where does Jon Snow get all his reputation from then? In 1930s, his books of On the Mob was republished by a guy called Wade Hampton Frost, and he was the first professor of epidemiology at John Hopkins School of Medicine, Hygiene and Public Health in the USA. And it's this republication of Jon Snow's books on the mode of the causation of cholera which whereby he got lasting recognition. And this is a quote from um, uh, Dr. Frost. Slow's work as a permanent of a masterpiece in the ordering and analysis of the kind of evidence which enters at some stage and in some degree into every problem of epidemiology, i.e. he tried to look at cause and effect and tried to find evidence to, to uh, support his theories. So that's where we leave Jon Snow. He was not appreciating his time about the cause of cholera. And it's only much later from the 1930s when his book is republished uh, that his standing goes up as probably uh, not one of the first good epidemiological, epidemiological study 
looking at the causes of cholera. And here's his legacy today, often calls the father of epidemiology. Here's the two blue plaques to him by the um, Royal Society of Chemistry, that Dr. John Snow, father of epidemiology, linked deaths of the water to the water pump and thus determined that cholera is a waterborne disease. And here's a plaque in the John Snow Plop. It's now called Broadwick Street. And it says, this is the site of the Broad Street pump associated with Dr. John Snow, who discovered in 1854 that cholera is conveyed by water. So he was right, but it took the uh, scientific and medical community many years to realize what he'd done and the profound influence that his, his, his observation, but also how he did it would have. And so that's where I'd like to finish on. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. And if you've got any questions, I'll be pleased to answer them. So thank you all very much indeed. Well, thank you uh, <clears throat> very much indeed, Mike. Very good talk indeed and uh, fascinating. Here we see uh, John Snow very much, uh, again, uh, an unsung hero in his own yeah. lifetime. And yeah. it's not only now that we begin to appreciate, you know, uh, what, what he did and, uh, you know, how well he did it, given the limitations in uh, uh, scientific uh, instrumentation and measurements at the time. So, yeah, I mean, he he was great. His first thing was asking people, yeah, and then drawing these um, little the, the maps effectively, and then looking other ways. If there was odd odd things like what's that brewery not getting it, going and looking at them and seeing why they didn't get it. So he was quite a good observationalist. So yeah, yeah, got to be. But it's a classic case, isn't it, in science that if there's a prevailing theory and someone comes along with a different, disproving the theory, often yeah. they're ignored. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I've got, um, let's look at the uh, chat box. There's um, one here from Mike Hollingsworth, uh, who says, in science, there is often a need for a paradigm shift in thinking. What general lessons are there from the shift from the uh, miasma to water as the source of cholera? Any general lessons? It's um, hmm. well, I think that the the general lesson I think is probably um, if more people had supported him, then it might have taken. We might have got the yeah. I mean, you, and, uh, it's, but you, I mean, if, even in my short scientific career, I came up with um, theories which didn't agree with the prevailing prevailing view and it took us ages to get in today to get the scientific community to change their minds so yes. when you say it's all a and someone goes no it's b the a people go no no it's still a and so i think if you want to overcome a prevailing theory you've got to work much much harder to um, overturn people's views and, so, you have. and i yeah. think in um in the modern day um, there are also lots of very strong commercial vested interests at work in yeah. uh, biasing public opinion against certain new theories. Um, yeah. I'm thinking of smoking, for example, the tobacco yeah. industry and what yeah. harm was done. Uh, yeah. Lead in petrol, another example. It's still killing people, you know. Uh, yeah. What, 100 years on? I don't know. It's something like that. Um, there we are. Um, we have another one from Diane here. Uh, do we know of the movement of people out of Broad Street? Um, oh, I don't know. Uh, out of the Broad Street area caused seeding of disease elsewhere? Yeah, I, I, no, I don't know. The, that's a no. really good question. I, I don't know the answer to uh, that one, I'm afraid. No. Um, as far as I'm aware, there was no reports of outbreaks, so probably no, but you never know. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's no more in the chat box. What I'm going to do is unmute everybody and uh, we'll start taking some questions. I can see some hands up there. Uh, let's 
just get uh, right. Okay, uh, Moyle, uh, you're on, sir. Right, thank you. Very, very interesting. There was a similar case on a much smaller scale in Mid Essex uh, a, a, that my attention has recently been drawn to that I've got to have a look at. Uh-huh. But the point I wanted to pick up on was the remark about uh, it was um, what the brief discussion after my Hollingsworth's, Michael Hollingsworth's comment, and that is that one of the issues around smoking, why it wasn't stamped on, discouraged, whatever, was because much of the early research was done in Nazi Germany. Hitler was a fanatical non-smoker, and it was felt, therefore, that it must be a good idea. You know, if a nasty person like Hitler doesn't like it, it must be a good idea to do it. And it's quite note. And other, oh. it, there have been one or two other issues like that. That's interesting. <laughs> okay, thank you for that, Mile. Um, Jane. Hello, thank you. Um, thanks, Mike. That was a really well researched and very interesting talk. I, I did enjoy it. Um, I think uh, a couple of comments. Um, the, me- the medical profession in the UK was quite slow in accepting the germ theories that the uh, Germans were doing, uh, yeah. Koch, even, even towards the end of the century. So yeah. um, they did like their um, miasma and they, they weren't, uh, they weren't um, pr- uh, persuaded by the, uh, the microbiology side. Um, it also, it's a story that demonstrates the, uh, the two aspects of the um, epidemiologists and the microbiologists looking at the same problem uh, from different aspects. And of course, the uh, uh, the current pandemic it demonstrates that as well. Um, epidem- epidemiologists have a bit of a different uh, uh, view to uh, those of us that are uh, virologists and microbiologists. Um, lastly, um, there is a John Snow Society, yeah, that's um, right. of which I am a member, um, oh, and wow. I have a a, a pin. Wow! <laughs> oh right. <laughs> <laughs> of the Broad Street Pump. Um, oh, there was an epidemiologist called Dr. Rosalind Stanwell-Smith that worked at the public health laboratory um, up until the mid 80s. And she was one of the ones that um, uh, pub, uh, really pushed for the blue plaque to go up. And she is a, or was a blue badge guide in London. And she oh, ran wow. um, walks around Soho which were, was very good on uh, the uh, places where Jon Snow um, uh, and the Broad Street Pump uh, uh, were active. And it was a really good talk. I'm, I'm sure she's not doing it anymore, but um, uh, it was great to be reminded of all that. Thanks very much, Mike. And, uh, thank, you, th- th- thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, uh, I'll just pick up a comment in the uh, chat box here from... Uh, uh, Jill Jenkins in Ronimich, he says, great talk, uh, thanks. The charts on life expectancy and causes of death should be shown <laughs> to all those who dislike vaccines. Here, here. Yeah. Uh, Yvette says, uh, it's rather reminiscent of uh, Semmelweis and midwives washing yeah. their hands, but doctors came straight from the anatomy theatre and examined women in childbirth without washing their hands. And there. Uh, there yeah. we go. Okay, let's pick up with you then, Frank. Yeah, just um, the uh, miasmatists. Um, it was quite, um, they had quite a powerful voice. They objected to the repeal of the Window Tax Act uh, because this would allow people to open up their windows and have windows built into their houses, which would allow miasma to enter and kill them. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Fascinating. Okay. Um, anybody else with uh, questions for Mike? Oh, nobody coming forward. Speak now. I don't have any questions, um, but I'll just say hello. Um, Julie, I've just got back from my medical appointment, so I'll watch the right. talk later. But just to say Cholera is very much still with us. 
um, mm. when I was a district medical officer in Zambia. Um, part of my role was managing two cholera outbreaks there. Yeah, yeah. indeed. Well, th thank you for that, Julie. Um, yeah, I've got a question. Um, oh, hello, Max. Max, Max here. Go on, Max. Uh, well, the, the life expectancy figures you showed are, are very low indeed. Do they, are they corrected as well for um, stillbirths and, uh, um, and youngsters who died, you know, in the first months? Um, because I, my impression was once you got through that stage, then life expectancy mm. was considerably la longer than um, those small numbers that were shown on the tables. Yeah, I, th well, I think what I got from the tables, life expectancy, uh, depending on where you lived. So if you lived in the country, with less pollution, you live, you live longer. And also what, where, what your strata was in society. Mm. So if you were really amongst the upper classes, you had a much better life than someone labouring. So that's where I got it. So even they might, even though it's like one in five died of childbirth, if you were a labourer, once you got through that, especially in London and Manchester, you didn't live at all. Probably because of the hard physical work, poor diets, sanitation and all that. Mm. It's, so it, it was like Edwin Chadwick had said, it's the um, environment which people are living in, which is causing them to have an unhealthy life and eventually dying early. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the way I got it. Yeah. The numbers themselves would obviously be very much biased downwards by that 20% of zeros. <laughs> I think there's still quite a lot of countries in the world where women have a 1 in 20 or 1 in 30 chance of dying of pregnancy-related yeah. illness. Mm. Um, and 1 in 5 children die before the age of 5. And I think yeah. they were, I haven't been to the talk, I say, I've just got back from medical appointment, but I think there was something similar in this country a hundred odd years ago. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The challenge, yeah. of course, is for us in now to say, can we relegate those high figures for women and children dying to history? At the moment, I don't think we're making progress, I'm sad to say. No, no. Okay, Julie, thank you for that. Um, Jeff Kirby from Weymouth. Good yeah, hello. Very good talk. Thank you very much. Uh, just a point I've read that Florence Nightingale died in 1910, still firmly believing in the miasma theory. <laughs> so some, some people just won't give up believing in their pet <laughs> theories. <laughs> good point. Good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well. Oh, thank you for that, Jeff. Uh, okay. Anybody else got uh, questions, comments, anything you like? Um, a few years ago, this Joe Cork here from Bristol. Hello, a few Joe. years ago, I um, returned from Pakistan with a case of Shigella, which is dysentery. And so, and that wasn't surprising. Um, but when I reported <laughs> when my samples went off to the Bristol Health Labs, um, they lost the bit that said just coming back from Pakistan. So suddenly they thought they had a case of dysentery in Bristol and the public health people oh came round. I'd, I'd gone to work for the day and they came round and Alan answered the door and they said, where, where is she? And he said, oh, she's a teacher, she's gone to work. And they went, oh my God. <laughs> and they thought that I was out there spreading dysentery among all the children and students. And he said, and they were really worried and then he said, you do know that she's just been back from Pakistan. And they went, oh, that's OK. Then we thought we had a real outbreak here. <laughs> <laughs> I was consigned to history as not a Bristol outbreak of Shigella at all. And oh. everybody breathed a sigh of relief. <laughs> but like the previous person said, I mean, these diseases, <clears throat> cholera, Shigella and those are still rife in many, many countries. Mm -hmm. And goodness knows how that's being impacted upon with the added COVID deaths. Because people, yeah, it's we're we're in a better situation here, and we don't lose so many in childbirth. But the rates are still high in other parts of the world. Um, I think Julie mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah, Joe. I know where, one where dysentery outbreak in a primary moment? school. Sorry. I know one dysentery outbreak in a primary school in the city where I live. And um, that was because it was a school where they were having behaviour, classroom discipline issues. So if children wanted to go to the toilet, they had to raise their hand 
and they had to ask for the toilet bag, which consisted of a single paper towel, a, a single sheet or very small number of sheets of toilet paper, not on a roll, and a small piece of soap. And so, of course, the children would not, would, if they were going for a wee, they didn't really want to sort of go and ask the teacher for this. So they used to go to the toilet without the soap, without any means of drying their hands. And sometimes when they got to the toilet, it wasn't just a wee. And they lacked the basic necessities for hygiene. And I thought that was appalling. And, and it, it took the microbiologists from the hospital to sort of say to the head and the teachers, look, this is not acceptable. We appreciate that, you know, there can be high drinks in toilets, but you can't expect children to raise their hand and say, I don't need just a wee miss. I need a, the, the full <laughs> bag, please. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. Um, good morning to you, Mike. Mike Hollingsworth. Can you unmute? Hi, Hold hello on. to everybody, and uh, some of me may know me as the uh, now uh, outgoing uh, U3A subject advisor for science. Nice to see so many faces I've communicated with. Um, another classic story is Dr. Jenner and the role of understanding mm. of smallpox. But yeah. actually, when they've looked into the deep history of that, they, they are aware that other countries, although they didn't really understand the cause of smallpox, had had edged towards it in terms of some treatments uh, well before Dr. Jenner. And I just wonder whether in the history of cholera, which is of course prevalent very much more in tropical countries, whether there is actually any, any evidence from these other countries that they actually had awareness that it was a waterborne disease <laughs> yeah. uh, and what might be causing it, what might be treatments and so forth. And, you know, we've got to be aware we're not a Western dominated and think we know everything about science. Do you, have you read up anything on other countries and their understanding of cholera prior to? No. To snow? No, no, no. But I think that's, that, that's a good question. I mean, all we could say with certainty is, it was very influ if, if, almost in retrospectively influential in sorting out the cause of cholera in London and therefore hope the rest, rest of England might. But we, say for India, where, where they think it probably originally, uh, I don't know what, what, what they were doing there. Yeah, okay. Well, well, obviously, his work you know, had worldwide implications in the yeah. end. In the end, yes. Please. Thank you. Excellent talk. Really appreciate it. Where I worked in Africa, it was thought to be witchcraft, like most other illnesses, and that was part of what we were trying to, to do, was to deal with the water and sanitation and, and spread the word that it, it wasn't an owl that had visited your house last night, it was actually something under your control. Um, in Bangladesh, when I was at the International Centre for Diarrhoea Research, um, obviously at the centre, it was very much known it was water and sanitation. And my impression, and this is based on sort of 20, 30 years ago, was that probably Bangladesh was further ahead with knowing the water and further ahead than where I was in Africa in terms of having water pumps um, and more importantly, not just donors donating money for the pumps, but having a much better system of having regular maintenance. And the water driver in the village was a very important person who'd had some basic mechanical training. And there was a sort of small levy on each house to pay a small salary for them and for parts so that the water pumps were maintained where sadly, where I worked in Africa, 90% of the few pumps there were, were actually out of action and not serviceable. Okay, yeah, sounds good. Okay, Julie, thank you for that. Diane Newell, um, good morning. Yeah, good morning. Um, I just wanted to uh, say that it, it's very common for, for diarrheal diseases, the epidemiology, to be quite different in the developed and underdeveloped worlds. So um, it's worth remembering that, um, for example, uh, 
Kampala back to Jejunai, which is very, very common um, disease in of, of food and waterborne disease in in the developed world, is not so common in adults in the underdeveloped world because by that time most people have become immune to it. But it's it's also oh worth thinking about how, how the ecology of uh, the, the habitats in these areas differs. In cholera in the, in the tropics, for example, um, the organism can actually grow on water weed um, in, in those sorts of temperatures, not in uh, the uh, European uh, context, of course. But so the epidemiology can be quite different for diarrheal diseases across the world. All right, that's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Right, thank you, Diane. Um, Alex, Alex Scott, would you? Can you unmute, Alex? You need to unmute. Okay, I'll keep my finger on the space bar. You can hear me now. Yeah, I was, I was just going to, with all this talk of other countries, point out that it's actually almost less than twenty years since they used to pump raw sewage um, into all the waters um, in in this country. I mean, uh, the yeah, still the estuary of the Liverpool, the Mersey estuary, for example, all the Manchester stuff was still being pumped in 20 years ago. Um, and now what's even worse is they appear to be starting to do it all again. Yeah. Now, you know, very poor sort of, um, in order to get, make money for their shareholders, we're now getting, <laughs> you know, uh, sewage being pumped in. And, uh, you know, one fears for lots of probably viral disease. It's probably, probably not cholera. But I can imagine, you know, an increase in some of these nasty things around. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, it is really inexcusable. Here we are in the 21st century. And yeah. It's happening all over again. Um, but even though they're, built, they're doing, the, they're, they obviously in London, they're doing the new super sewer, which is a you know, much more uh, wizzo banger one than Basiljet did. But if you read what they're doing about that, even then they can't guarantee that sometimes they won't be discharging untreated sewage into the River Thames. Mm. Despite building a, a new fantastic one, they still won't guarantee it. So you sit there thinking, wow, don't you? Oh dear. Oh well. Okay. Um, just looking over at the chat box, we have a, a comment from Stephen Birchall. Uh, he said, really, really good, uh, very full graphs. And um, he said, life expectancy is um, uh, surprisingly low. Are you aware people are not living any longer? Just there's more of us living uh, to an old age, but not any older. And he says this uh, comes from gravestones, uh, research into gravestones. Well, yeah, I don't know if you have a comment. I'm not sure what the Office of National St Statistics would say. But uh, there must be figures. You have to look them up. I thought life expectancy was, was is it like peaking out in the UK? Yeah. It did yeah. go up, and now, and now it's coming, off. Definitely. coming flat now, isn't it? I mean, some areas are predicting it might start to go down. Mm. Yeah. I think it depends on how you calculate it, obviously, because if you take an average and more people are living yeah. to old age, then obviously the life expectancy would be going up as more and more people reach that old age and perhaps that's the point that um uh, Stephen is making here um right we've got uh mile again yeah mile. um it's quite noticeable that in the united states there are significant differences in life expectancy between different i don't want to use an emotive word but between different categories of persons mm. basically the better educated one is the more likely one is to reach what appears to be the natural maximum which is somewhere about somewhere in the mid 90s somewhere between the mid 90s and the mid 10s but the less educated you are the uh Consequently, the poorer diet you have, the more likely you are to die very much younger. Yeah. Mm. And it's, the, the American figures are quite frightening. Are they? Yeah, there's, there's that famous underground map in London, isn't it? 
where they're doing life expectancy to go out from central London to the to, to the area, so you have to go to more poor areas. The life expectancy even longer is de de is de decreases, and again, that comes back to Edwin Chad Chadwick's view donkeys years ago. That it's the type of life we're, we're leading that's obviously shortening our lifespan. Some people, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Stephen is clarifying his uh, comment. Um, what he means to say is basically no one lives past. For example, 120 is just more of us are living into old age. So, yeah, um, yeah, there are there are one or two exceptions you hear about, but very very few. Uh, yeah, take the point. Okay, um, Jane in Reading. <laughs> Hello, uh, just again. just to uh, finish off again, can I? Um... Uh, another uh, interest of mine is uh, sewage in water. Um, and can I uh, say that the uh, a visit to uh, the Crossness uh, Museum where Basil Jet put his first steam um, powered engine to pump sewage away from the centre of London uh, outwards uh, towards the estuary is well worth a visit. And uh, I've been there recently. <laughs> so so oh, wow. it's a good follow up if you're anywhere yeah. near um, the, yeah. uh, uh, the London area. It's it's really, uh, well, I, I presume it's open again now. It probably hasn't been open for the last two years, uh, but it's fascinating. Thank you, Jane. I'd like, I'd, I did love your little, um, your little Broad Street pump pin. That was, that was excellent. Can we see it again? Uh, yeah, um, I, I'm very pleased that Mike did this talk because I sent me rooting around my off, my little office this morning, desperately trying to find this again. Oh, there it is. Wonderful. Look at that. Yes, it it is a, a stainless steel Broad Street pump. Um, I, I think I paid twelve pounds towards um, the John Snow Society to get the uh, get. The, I've never actually worn it, of course, because I. <laughs> I'd retired by the time I got it, but um, the Johnson Snow Society might be worth looking up on the uh, internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's good. Oh, brilliant. Okay, um, I'm going to wrap up very soon. I've just got a comment here from Brian McMahon. Um, uh, he recommends. Uh, oh no, it's Yvette. I'm sorry. Uh, I recommend Thomas Mann's novel *Death in Venice*. Which highlights the quarantine and public health procedures used to deal with cholera in the early 1900s. And uh, Brian McMahon says, We are constantly being asked to donate money to provide low cost facilities to supply clean water. Why is this not a priority for responsible governments? Yeah, that, I, I would question that. They can always afford tanks and missiles. I'm always <laughs> saying that. Oh dear. Uh, yes, there we are. Well, I'm going to like to wrap things up um, about now. It's been an excellent morning, Mike. Thank you very, very much indeed for oh, it's a pleasure. Thank a, a super you. talk. Um, I think we all found it uh, really very, very interesting indeed. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's an interesting uh, sort of crossover between uh, medicine and uh, the, the detective side of things, the science and, and um, uh, the, the hard work that basically goes into capturing the evidence required. So yeah, um, yeah very well researched, well illustrated and uh, nicely done, Mike. Thank you ever so much for uh, oh, pleasure. Thank coming you. in this morning. Thank okay, you. well, we, uh, please all thank Mike for a brilliant morning.